Hello, everyone. Welcome to the MIF Plus Plus seminar. Today, Professor Steve Power from Lancaster University will talk about the mathematics of crystal flexes and vibrations. Over to you, Steve, please. Thank you, Vitaly, and thank you very much for the opportunity to talk at this seminar. It's uh, particularly nice to have um, uh, people with applied interests in the audience, some very distinguished people, and um, giving a talk that tries to cross the divide is always uh, challenging and, and interesting. Um, also, I've enjoyed uh, looking at some of your seminars uh, as recorded on your website, and I enjoyed uh, Greg McCollum's talk last week. Um, so hopefully there's something here to, to interest people. Of course, the title is uh, an overstatement. This is some of the mathematics of crystal flexes that I've been interested in. And <clears throat> the topics that I'm going to uh, consider in today's talk um, is uh, infinitesimal flexes or first order movements of um, idealized uh, bond node frameworks. So the bonds are inextensible and the way the, um, the framework vibrates, the model crystal vibrates, I'll describe um, in due course. So the first six slides are giving you an impression of the, the topic, and then around about slide seven or eight, then I'll, I'll talk about notation and mathematics and hopefully keep things at an elementary level. So yes, by background, I'm a mathematician, um, and I'd like to talk about some of the mathematics behind identifying uh, crystal flexes and classifying them. And in the main, today, it's a fairly straightforward mathematics, linear algebra. Okay, some of the vector spaces are infinite dimensional, but nevertheless, um, the uh, methods are fairly straightforward. I'll <clears throat> quickly go through the statement of six theorems, some of them fairly recent, and uh, a couple of them seem to have rather deep proofs, and these theorems uh, give aspects of the rigidity and the flexibility of these idealized frameworks. Of course, there's the applied background, um, and just a little sketch there. Uh, in 1940, um, Max Born and co-workers worked on crystal vibrations in great detail. I'll give a quote from him in a minute, which is relevant. In the 90s and perhaps beyond, Martin Dove and co-workers worked on something that known as rigid unit modes. And this is very relevant to uh, the mathematics that I'll talk about today or vice versa. Um, and <clears throat> more recently, there's interest in surface modes, topological boundary modes, protected modes. I can't tell you anything technical about those except that um, I think the some of the spectrums that I talk about are indeed highly related to boundary modes. So here's the quote from Max Born at the end of a 1940 paper on the stability of crystal lattices. The stability of lattices, I think he's talking about bond node frameworks, is discussed from the standpoint of the method of small vibrations. It is shown that it is not necessary to determine the whole vibrational spectrum, but only its long wave part. So just to translate what that means, long wave vibration is the same as a low energy vibration. I also call it a first order vibration. And <clears throat> This is a dynamical consideration, and he's pointing to the fact there's a great simplification here for some of the questions which involve um, uh, ignoring the, the high energy oscillation uh, of bonds. Um, so here's a picture of a rigid unit mode um, for a rather simple one-dimensional uh, one, one periodic framework in two dimensions. So these are supposed to be squares with a, a diagonal in them. They're a little bit distorted. Um, 
There's a building block here of three uh, joints, as I'll call them later, and uh, five bonds. And if I translate that, structure, I generate the whole um, periodic framework. And the idea is that this double triangle is rigid, um, but it can rotate a bit. Um, I'm not imagining uh, a contraction taking place uh, from minus infinity to infinity. So no overall um, contraction, but nevertheless, we could see that there's an alternating rotations and imagine them vibrating in an alternating manner. And this would be called a, a rigid unit mode because there are rigid units which are unaffected except maybe to tiny um, stretching. And <clears throat> we're interested in identifying such rigid unit modes for uh, two-dimensional crystals and three-dimensional crystals. And the program that Dove and his co-workers carried out is very much applied. They um, looked at actual materials and did whatever, neutron bombardment, and then measured these um, modes, tried to count, count, the, uh, count how many there were. They're really counting the basis of a vector space. And that was very successful in that their theoretical results matched to a close extent, the simulation results that they did. They'd have a model for this type of um, framework. So <clears throat> here's a little bit of theory. I'm going to go through the slide very quickly. Um, if you know about this kind of um, equation for an oscillating uh, system of nodes in a, let's say a two dimensional periodic array, then that's fine. But the simplification that uh, Born was alluding to is the fact that um, if we consider low energy or low frequency, alpha is a frequency here and T is time, then we needn't um, worry about this equation. We can just concentrate, forget the frequency, and concentrate on the initial velocity of the vibrating system, and that's a vector. Um, so I know what I've said is cryptic, but I'll, I'll come back to it later. So here's some uh, images uh, giving you some of my favorite um, uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional bar joint frameworks. So first one is the Kagome, which uh, Greg mentioned last week. And what I have here on the right is what I'll call a motif. Um, which is a building block for the entire framework. Um, when I add the natural translations, let's say two units in this direction horizontally and two units at 60 degrees, then I will generate the entire crystal. So I've got representatives for the three translation equivalence classes being the joints and representatives for the six translation classes of the bars that join the joints. Um, <clears throat> this is just a little part of a 3D crystal um, for sodalite, which has got very beautiful symmetry. Um, if you imagine six of these stuck around a cube, then you've got the sodalite cage and you continue this in a, a natural manner and um, there's a nice, very flexible as it turns out, uh, 3D structure. So here's two simple um, frameworks that uh, illustrate certain things later on. The first one I call the kite framework, it's a kite on its side in two dimensions. And I've shown the translation vectors here or periodicity vectors, which will generate the whole of the 2D framework. So, this building block has two vertices, two joints, and uh, five bars or five edges. And we can imagine this rotating slightly. Um, if it's rotating about the center of this crossbar, then for a small velocity going up here, there'll be a larger velocity here. 
And unlike the chain example that I gave for rums, this will lead to amplifying motions and therefore not very realistic unless you cut the thing in half and get rid of the uh, infinite expansion. So this bipyramid framework um, is obtained by translating this double pyramid um, in the natural way and creating a whole collection of bipyramids with little triangular gaps between them. So I won't talk about that too much more now. Um, another 3D favorites would be the the cubical grid in three dimensions as a three-dimensional Kagome and one that um, Dove and co-workers looked at, um, I forget, maybe it's perovskite, um, the octahedral framework where a regular octahedron is um, the basic <clears throat> building block and you join them corner-wise and fill out space in that manner. Okay, so now I'm going to try and slow down a bit and talk about um, mathematics behind uh, modeling the flexes of these frameworks. And first of all, I'm going to talk about a finite bar joint framework, um, beloved of people in Lancaster who study the rigidity of these things. They're very subtle, even for finite frameworks. So what is it? Um, it's a graph and a collection of points or joints, we'll call them, in a d-dimensional space, d will be two or three. And these uh, joints are labeled P1 up to Pn, and they're joined by bars, a bar between Pi and Pj, I'll just label by Pi, Pj for the moment. Um, they're given by the edges of the graph G, which is the underlying structure graph. Mm. So I guess what we're looking at here with script G is a spatial representation of the uh, graph. Now I'm going to start thinking about flexing it, if I can, by applying a velocity vector to each joint. Well, first of all, the structure um, might be rigid or it might be flexible. So these joints are universal joints. So bars will rotate, um, but they can't change their lengths. So I'll come to some examples in a minute, but let's think about um, these velocity vectors. It's a whole group of vectors um, at the joints of the framework, and they form a finite dimensional vector space. <clears throat> And the particular velocity vectors that we're interested in are the ones that don't stretch the bars. So a flex will be a collection of velocities at the joints, u1 up to un, that satisfy this non-stretching equation, which is saying that the, the component of the velocity in the direction of the bar at both ends is the same. So the bar can move without changing its length or rotate, but there'll be no stretching element um, if these were that would happen if these were different. So from the joints and their differences when they uh, have an edge between them, we get a set of linear equations. And if we can find a, a velocity vector u1 up to un that satisfies these equations, then we have a first order flex. Um, so with this set of linear equations, as usual, there's a, a matrix of coefficients. That's called the rigidity matrix. And that's really the key structure that um, I'll be talking about later, which is somewhat elaborated to take into account the crystal data. So here for my finite bar joint framework in two dimensions or three dimensions, this rigidity matrix will have n d columns, <clears throat> um, n for the joints, d for the dimension, and that will correspond to the dimension of the domain space of this matrix, if we view it as a transformation. The rows of the matrix are labeled by the edges of the structure graph. So with this setup, with the uh, 
a spatial graph with its joints P1 up to Pn and its edges, we can think about the flex space, which is in actual fact equal to the null space of this rigidity matrix. So here are two finite frameworks with interesting flexes. Um, they're in two dimensions. Uh, here's a velocity vector. Um, I perhaps should have put one arrow on there. Um, there's a zero velocity at uh, these four joints. Um, here where the uh, uh, there's a parallel between this bar and this bar, uh, you can imagine there's an infinitesimal velocity here which won't stretch the joint uh, initially. This is supposed to be a square within a square. This too has a, an interesting first order flex, um, which gives a little rotational motion to the uh, four inner joints. And these particular infinitesimal flexes do not extend to a, a continuous deformation, a finite motion, as it's sometimes called. Um, that is another way to create infinitesimal flexes. If you have a bar joint framework and there is a smooth motion that you can make, then the initial velocity will be a set of velocities at the joints, which will form an infinitesimal flex, or I'll just call it a flex. So hopefully that's clear. Now, how can we jack this up to a crystal and Notation is important. We have to make a commitment to a notation at some point. So <clears throat> what I'm proposing here is that for my building blocks, I will label the joints by kappa. And let us suppose that there are n joints in this building block. We might imagine it to be a, a unit cell in a simple example. Now. K is uh, a multi-label, it uh, consists of integers, and that corresponds to the translation of according to the periodicity vectors. So in two dimensions, um, there'll be two period vectors, which I've not mentioned here. Um, they're kind of in the background. I've mentioned them for the kite, for example. And <clears throat> K, which will be um, a pair in the case of two dimensions, a pair of integers, labels the shifted base building block. So I've got a dual notation which will locate any joint within the crystal uh, according to how it looks in a typical building block and which building block we're in, kappa and K. Now let's denote this um, difference vector which appeared uh, two slides back um, by PE when E is some bar of the framework. Then this little equation here is the no stretch condition, which we want if this infinite sequence of velocities is to be a flex. So a velocity vector is labeled U kappa K and each u kappa k is a velocity, is a vector in R2. Or if we want to go to complex numbers, it would be in C2. So here's an example, an interesting example, actually, of a simple uh, infinitesimal flex um, of the grid framework in two dimensions. So. Um, all the velocities um, are zero away from this uh, vertical line, and the joints here receive the same vertical velocity. Um, could be 0, 1 as a vector. And I've labeled this velocity according to the labeling scheme. So 1 is the kappa equals 1. Well, where's the building block here? I could just take the building block to the, be the single vertex and these two edges, two bars. So that might be a label for this particular velocity. So you can see that there's no 
deformation of any of the bars with this arrangement. And I, re I refer to this as a line supported flex of the grid framework. Steve, Steve, could I ask a question about why I'm, I'm going to spend some time with yes, certainly, certainly uh, please. Do. Nice example. Mm. Uh, so, could I clarify uh, you, you are moving uh, points only on one vertical line here? Yes. Um, so, do you assume what um, so when the line lattice is, is it still z squared for, for this? Um, framework I, I didn't catch that i mean the uh, the so for example these vectors um uh, are they they're not supposed to be preserved by all lattice translations no there's no this is uh -huh. a single solitary line receiving okay. non-zero velocities mm -hmm. um everything else is frozen um so you can imagine um <clears throat> It's easier in some ways to imagine there's a vibration going on with this infinite vertical line, mm -hmm. um, and its initial velocity is what I've pictured in here. Um, of course, I could put a, a vertical velocity um, on this line here of the same type, and I could continue it periodically. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it turns out that every flex, as I've described, of this framework can be made up of an infinite sum of these types of line uh, supported uh, flexes, these component flexes. Mm -hmm. But actually, that's a little bit away from the mathematics that we're going to be led to. And it's kind of curious the way that these turn up actually as limits of periodic flexes as the period becomes bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. In this particular framework, uh, uh, what are the rigid bars between... I'm sorry? Uh, what are the rigid bars between nodes? Do you have any rigid bars? Um, these are rigid bars between the nodes. So um, all this horizontal and vertical... Um... Just horizontal and vertical. So it's a very simple grid framework. Okay. So if we move all points on the vertical axis upwards and all okay. other points uh, remain at the play positions, then uh, the length of, of, say, horizontal bar, say, from the origin... That's true. That's zero. true, but I'm not actually thinking of a, a finite motion. I'm just thinking of um, mm -hmm. the initial velocity. Okay. So there's a weakness here. You can mm -hmm. imagine that... Soon there'll be resistance because of what you've described, mm -hmm. but um, it won't be the same resistance. Um, it's a bit like this example here. With these um, nodes at zero velocity, um, I cannot even apply a velocity to this inner vertex because of um, these being zero. Mm -hmm. um, so it's absolutely rigid. Okay. But this vertex here is a bit shaky, you know, and for that ah. for that reason, there's um, I'm I'm that's what this infinitesimal flex is determining these kind of shaky systems. Okay, yeah, thank okay. you very much for clarification. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so um, these are called uh, velocity vectors um velocity field is maybe a better word because that invokes the entire set of um of nodes and their velocities um velocity vector i'm usually using for this infinite set of velocities on the nodes on the joints so here's an example of uh, an infinitesimal flex that let, let me spend some time on this slide um, it gives a hierarchy of different types of infinitesimal flexes um, what we've looked at just then was the third example of a linearly localized flex which is its support where it's non-zero is um, on a line or with this more relaxed definition the support is close to a line um, <clears throat> a local flex or sometimes written type C00, 
uh, is one that might be finitely supported. So it's possible to have all velocities zero except in a small region where there's um, uh, some oscillation. And this is true of sodalite. And when this happens, um, you there are flexes all over the place because of periodicity. And that's quite an extreme example. Um, <clears throat> but mainly what I'm going to be talking about are not these decaying flexes in, in part two or the local flexes in part one or these linear localized flexes. I'm being, going to talk about different types of periodic flexes. And this is kind of fundamental to a lot of research in that periodic boundary conditions are usually assumed. Um, perhaps modulo, modulo some kind of phase change as you go from one uh, unit cell to the next. So what do I mean by a periodic flex for a given periodic structure? Well, an example would be if I were to apply arrows like this example um, to the, uh, the second and the fourth and so on. If I applied these arrows periodically in the, to the left and to the right. Um, now, <clears throat> I have to be careful here because um, what does periodic relate to? Um, does it relate to the given periodic structure? Um, well, yes, in this particular example four, I'm assuming that to be the case. Now, of course, the periodic structure isn't unique. The building blocks can be bigger and the periods can be bigger. So there will be an issue at the end about, you know, is this spectrum dependent on the periodic structure or not? when we come to a spectrum. And more interesting, and this um, occupied mathematicians quite a bit, um, and I'll mention the theorem later, is uh, <clears throat> flexes which are periodic, but the lattice is allowed to move. It's allowed to flex itself. So a way you can imagine that is that the periodicity vectors are also allowed to uh, flex infinitesimally. So this takes in infinitesimal rotation, which is quite dramatic when you go into outer regions, the, the velocities have to be very large to support this rotation. And also shearing and bulk contractions of an infinitesimal nature, they also correspond to periodic flexes relative to a moving periodic structure. Now, <clears throat> This flex in type uh, six um, is really the kind of flex that Martin Dove and uh, other people were trying to measure. They're kind of the pure frequencies that you can detect in certain crystal structures. And these fit in with Bloch's theorem. If you're familiar with Bloch's theorem, um, we're talking about flexes which are periodic modulo a phase factor as you go from one building block to its neighboring building block. Um, so that phase factor might be a change of sign or it might be um, a rotation of some kind. So it's in this context that it's pretty essential to consider not just real valued velocities, but complex valued velocities. So the velocity will be a comp, a vector in complex space so that we can take the real part and get flexes in that have geometric meaning and we can as we do with wave motion understand oscillation as the real part of complex rotation then more exotic uh, two topics that i've been interested in and this is a very natural idea that um, if you add two periodic motions together and their uh, periods are incommensurate, then what you have is a function which is almost periodic. And there's a theory of almost periodic functions, uh, going back to Besikovich and Bohr. And <clears throat> it's a natural for crystal structures to imagine flexes and also vibrations as being almost periodic. And so it would be interesting to determine when 
a crystal framework has no such flexes when it's rigid for all kinds of possible aperiodic vibrations. And now, finally, a rather abstract um, concept, it seems at first, is to consider arbitrary velocity fields, uh, whether there can be a flex or not. And what does it mean to characterize when it's absolutely rigid in the sense that there's no possible uh, velocity field, which is a flex? So I'll talk about that in uh, in a couple of the theorems that I met, or one of the theorems that I mentioned. So I hope that's given you an impression uh, that there is a kind of different classes of of velocity vectors, and therefore different classes of flexes. And we say that the uh, crystal framework is rigid with this type of flex if the only flex of that type are the rather trivial ones, infinitesimal translation is always there, and infinitesimal rotation is always there. So for each type of flex, there's a type of rigidity. So now I want to talk about the pure flexes, uh, the pure modes. These are because it's a uh, commonplace notion that um, general oscillatory motion is made up as a superposition of uh, pure modes. So the notation for these modes is written down here in the case of two-dimensional crystal. So <clears throat> as before, a velocity field is an infinite set of velocities, one for each joint, P kappa K receives the velocity U kappa K, and now this is going to be, in the case of 2D, a velocity vector with two complex um, numbers being the components of the complex velocity. We say that U is periodic modulo the multiphase omega 1, omega 2 um, in the two torus. So these are just unimodular complex numbers, functions of modulus one. If when I go from one uh, building block to the next, there's a change of phase. So this is shown in this equation. The velocity in the kappa k block is determined by the corresponding joint in the base block, u kappa is the velocity this, this velocity here, u kappa zero zero, is the velocity of the kappa joint in the base block. And in the kth building block, this will appear with this multiplicative factor, which is just a complex number. <clears throat> then completely analogous, um, if I replace that unimodular complex number by um, a general complex number, which is non-zero, then I have this more geometric uh, multi-factor as governing how the flex uh, is determined by the flex in the base block. So in the first case, we say the flex is a rigid unit mode or a rum. In the second case, we say that it's a geometric mode. So somewhat more general. So now I want to describe um, the rigidity matrix, which actually is a matrix of functions, which corresponds to detecting these RUMs or the geometric modes. So I'll give it a direct definition in the next slide, but what's coming up is, um, Suppose we have a 2D crystal with N joints in the uh, building block and M bars in the building block. Then I'm going to make a matrix of functions in a very specific way. Um, the entries are going to be polynomials in the complex variables, Z1, Z2, 
said one inverse, said two inverse, non-zero complex numbers, um, complex variables, and <clears throat> call these Laurent polynomials, but they're mainly monomials. And this matrix that we get will be related to determining the rigid unit modes. So here's what it looks like in two dimensions. Let's write the, the bar vector for the edge E in the base building block. Um, that's the difference between the end joints uh, as a vector. Let's write that as alpha X, alpha Y for the components of this bar vector. Then this edge E in the base block is going to label a row of this fancy rigidity matrix, which I'm calling Psi for the crystal C. And it mainly consists of zeros, except for information in the kappa and tau columns, uh, kappa and tau being the two joints at the end, uh, the labels for the joints at the end of the bar E. And we should really think of this P, E, Z, K as, in the case of two dimensions, two entries, the alpha X and alpha Y multiplied by, and here's multinomial notation, which I haven't spelt out, but Z to the minus K would be Z1 to the minus K1, Z2 to the minus K2. Now, it's possible to have an edge which goes from one building block to the next building block. Um, and in that case, it could even go to a joint with the same kappa label. And in the quotient graph, this would correspond to a loop that uh, uh, is familiar to many people. Here, um, however, the uh, this doesn't correspond to a loop in the uh, in the crystal itself. And it turns out the, the mathematics in this case governs that the edge uh, labels a row of this type in the rigidity matrix. So with that information, just using the building block data, one can make a matrix. And this is what it looks like in the case of the bipyramid. Even for that small example, it's a bit complicated to do by hand. So I don't expect you to digest it other than to notice that um, the these Z1 and Z2 are the two mysterious variables that I've introduced um, which are to do with the um, the phase changes of a velocity. So the how does the this rigidity matrix detect a run? Well, <clears throat> The way to describe it is that here we have a matrix. If I can find values of Z1 and Z2, um, these are corresponding to the multiplicative factor. Um, then if I, if I fix those values, let's say omega 1 and omega 2, then I have a, an ordinary matrix with uh, complex entries. And then if I have a vector in the kernel, it will just be a velocity vector for the building block, um, six nodes in this case. Then if that's in the kernel, in the null space, as with the finite rigidity matrix, then this will generate a phase periodic flex. So, um, this will become clearer when, when I define the rigid node spectrum and the uh, geometric spectrum. So 
Let's do that here. <clears throat> what is gamma of the crystal and what is omega of the crystal? In the background, we have the periodic structure and the building block, which is assumed. Um, and the geometric spectrum is going to be the set of um, values for Z1 and Z2, which I'm going to call omega 1 and omega 2, where the kernel of the rigidity matrix, the null space, is non-zero. So just as the rigidity matrix for a finite graph um, has the fact that its kernel corresponds to flexes, that's what's going on here after we substitute omega 1 and omega 2. Um, it's the case that um, if I generate from a vector in this kernel, which will be um, a velocity vector on the building block, if I generate a velocity vector for the entire framework using this phase multiplier continuation, then this will be a rigid unit mode. So <clears throat> let me mention two other interpretations of this fancy matrix. Um, I mean, I first um, got involved with it uh, in work with John Owen, um, where we were thinking about flexes which decayed in a square summable way, a kind of finite energy distribution of velocities. And in that case, the rigidity matrix, which has the same definition as in the finite case, we can think of as an operator transforming these velocities into actually stresses on the bars. And it turns out to be a Hilbert space operator and it, tra it commutes with translations and there's a natural mathematics which allows you to take the Fourier transform of the situation and end up with um, a function, uh, a matrix function, whereby the transform of this infinite matrix, infinite matrix is the multiplication by a matrix valued function. So it has that maybe somewhat involved um, interpretation if you're not um, used to Fourier transforms. The other interpretation which I've found particularly useful in joint work with um, Lefteris Castis at Lancaster is that in actual fact, this is this, this matrix valued function is actually the transfer function when we view the rigidity matrix of the crystal as a giving a discrete equation system whereby you start off with a velocity vector, um, but use this compact notation that um, it's actually a vector valued sequence on Z2. Um, with this interpretation, uh, then um, one is able to use other methods. But the the simplest interpretation of what this function is, is that um, if you work out um, the equations, the flex equations for a phase periodic flex, and there'll be, that will be a finite uh, linear algebra equation system, um, because we've specified a particular phase, the omega one and the omega two, or multi-phase, then that matrix, its null space will correspond to phase periodic flexes. So <clears throat> this omega of C, which is the set of um, uh, these unimodular pairs of complex numbers um, in the that make the uh, kernel non-zero, this is exactly the set of 
um, rums uh, or the frequencies for rums that uh, Dove and co-workers were identifying. So because we identify it in a mathematical way, um, we can make certain comments about it. The fact that it's an algebraic variety leads one to expect that there will be curved surfaces in the set of rumps. So I should say here that thinking of a subset of the torus is somewhat complicated. So what people usually do is um, think of the torus as uh, being the unit square with the usual identification of opposite sides. And then the rum spectrum is recorded as a subset of the unit square. And in that interpretation, what we're looking at is the reduced wave vector in reciprocal space. So let me, in the last uh, four minutes, just talk about um, the theorems that uh, mathematicians have been interested in uh, determining and mainly uh, my interests are list here. The, the slides will contain a bit more commentary on these theorems, but we can interpret periodic rigidity. When is a crystal framework um, rigid in the sense that there are no periodic velocity fields giving a flex of the crystal. Well, <clears throat> that's if and only if the there's a specific periodic rigidity matrix which has maximum rank. So, and that rigidity matrix turns out to be just the evaluation of this uh, function matrix or matrix of functions at the points where Z1 up to Zn are equal to one, um, corresponding to the origin of reciprocal space. Now, when the axes are allowed to flex, that gives a more subtle notion of periodic flexibility, um, a wider notion, then Borsia and Strenu um, uh, discovered the, the matrix that determines um, uh, rigidity in that case. Saying it has maximum rank is the way of saying that the null space is as small as it can be. Um, namely, it just contains the translational, um, the phases of translational modes. Um, going on from that, um, uh, with my research student and uh, colleague Derek Kitson, we um, determined when the uh, a framework is rigid for almost periodic flexes. And the key condition is that the RUM spectrum should be as small as it can be. So I have some comments on the slide there about how that works. Then finally, these um, three theorems, um, uh, now I'm talking about absolute rigidity where I'm interested in there being, trying to identify when the only possible velocity flex, even exponentially increasing ones, um, must be trivial in the sense of being an infinitesimal translation or rotation. And <clears throat> the um, answer is that C will be first order rigid if and only if it's first of all periodically rigid for the movable lattice, and secondly, that the, the geometric spectrum is trivial. Um, the, this also allows us to identify when the flex space is uh, finite dimensional. And there are some interesting examples, kind of alternating um, squares examples, which are covered by this and the kite framework also. Um, finite dimensional if and only if the geometric spectrum is finite. And it's really the theorem six, which uh, is behind this, and this is quite a deep theorem, it describes how the flex space, which can include these line supported uh, infinitesimal flexes, for example, um, must contain special um, uh, 
flexes, which are a bit like the modes, but somewhat more general. We call them PG sequences, um, which means short for polynomially weighted geometric multi-sequence. So it looks like what I'm circling here. Um, there's a velocity of the building block at the base building block. And then we allow polynomial um, increase as we go out to building blocks further away from the origin. And there's a phase factor here. So <clears throat> this theorem uses some quite deep algebra um, going back to uh, somebody called Lefranc, Marcel Lefranc. Um, and Left Terrace and I managed to generalize his scalar valued theorem to the vector valued case, which is what we needed for these um, uh, these uh, velocity spaces of velocity vectors. So I think um, I've got some papers here listed that uh, you can look at in the slides. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Steve. So first, let us thank Steve for the nice presentation, please. And uh, and I invite questions. So first, yeah, let me actually stop the recording.